Well, howdy. I'm John Hart Asher. Uh, let me ask you folks, when you hear the word pollinator, what comes to your mind? If you want a garden jam-packed with pollinators, what in the world are you going to plant? Well, today, luckily, we have Rachel Rays, landscape architect at Rays Design and co-founder of Pollinate Austin, zooming in, so to speak, on plants, trying to attract specific wildlife demographics. It is great to see you, Rachel. How are you doing? Great. Thanks so much for having me. Yes. Well, thank you for meeting from afar. Yes. Uh, given the circumstances. <laughs> uh, I also must introduce really quickly, I believe we have a certain sweet pea. That we is do. We have a guest. We have a, a, a superstar. <laughs> <laughs> and sweet pea, Just to be clear, though, is not a pollinator, correct? She is, uh, maybe unintentionally, she's pollinated <laughs> a thing. Who knows? <laughs> Well, I do have some mysterious patch of sunflowers in my backyard. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, uh, so besides being a landscape architect, uh, you're you're part of the Festival Be Beach Food Forest. You're a committee me member there. You're involved with Grow Green. Uh, you work with Zilker, Zilker Botanical Gardens as a board member. Uh, you're part of the Urban Professionals Club, uh, and you're a Native Plant Society member. I mean, holy smokes, that's a lot of stuff, but let's focus really quickly on pollinators. You are the co-founder of Pollinate Austin. Tell us a little bit about that organization. It is a group and it was started actually by a cold email to the city that I sent that I said, I want Austin to become a B city, cert a B certified B city. Um, okay. and so we have, it's a group of um, myself, some beekeepers, some city staff, um, and we're all just very passionate about, about pollinators, some entomologists, gardeners, um, and we are working to get Austin to become a certified bee city, and we're also working on a number of projects. Um, we have a newsletter that goes out all about pollinators in Austin, all about events that are um, correlated to pollination, and um, we're updating the hive at the Austin Nature and Science Center. That's a big um, cool. exhibit. Yeah. So we're we're all about anything pollinator specific we, we do. Let's really quickly get into this. Uh, what is a pollinator? Kind of basic terms. A pollinator is anything that moves pollen from one thing to another. So what happens usually is um, bees or butterflies or hummingbirds or bats um, go are attracted to a flower. Uh, because of their nectar and or their pollen um, and then they unintentionally or intentionally sometimes like bees you eat pollen um, for protein and so but but a lot of them just go for the nectar and then right. accidentally get a lot of pollen on their body it's kind of like cheeto dust it's like eventually just gets everywhere Either. and they carry it from one from one plant to the next and in doing so that tiny little gesture of dropping that pollen from the other plant to the to the next one allows the for the proliferation of the plant it, it turns it goes into the stigma and it turns into a seed which eventually turns into a flower or a fruit so it's basically the begin the process that creates everything beautiful and edible and it's pretty important because if i remember correctly there's about 80 percent of plants require pollination right yeah they say like every third bite you take requires some sort of pollinators before we dig into sort of this plants that we're, we're looking at targeting really quickly when you're looking at establishing a pollinator garden what are some of those components that you need for those plants to thrive i mean what are the just the absolute basics <laughs> you gotta have yeah so for for the plants we're gonna always need good soil um right. Water is is important, especially in Texas. Um, sun, you know, some some actually a lot of hummingbird plants are more shade tolerant. So, um, depending on your your shade and sun situation, you don't necessarily need full sun or, or anything. Right. You really want to work with what your site has, and then the desire to at least maintain it because it will need a little bit of maintenance. Um, nothing is unfortunately zero water or zero maintenance. What are some other things we need to consider, right? Because there's certain pollinators need certain types of plants, right? 
Sure. Yeah. So, I mean, all pollinators are also going to need water. So that's a good thing to, if you're trying to attract any of them, um, that's a good thing to have around. Uh, if you have a bird bath, that's great for birds. Um, you could put rocks in it for butterflies and bees to make it a little less deep. When you think about like for bees specifically, um, they, they often work in mass. So they, mm. they'll deal with one type of plant um, at, at once. And then they'll, you know, so if you have 10 apples, they'll deal with 10 apple trees and then they'll go to the oranges and then they'll go to the pomegranate. So, um, you'll want to think about that in terms of when you're, when you're really looking at your space, where can I put a few, to, few types of the same plant in one area to allow for them to, you know, have less energy, um, exerted. Well, let's jump into the plants. I'm excited. What about coneflower? I really want to encourage people to look at is like the leaf shape and the leaf, um, like if you were a big, if you were a big fat bumblebee, would yeah. you feel comfortable sitting on the, the leaf or somewhere on a part of that, you know, cause, cause right. they're not just hovering around there, um, you know, posting up, some are even taking naps. So, sure. um, coneflower is great because it's a really, it has a really sturdy core and it also has pretty comparatively sturdy um, petals. And so that is a really great bee, bumblebees, smaller native bees, um, even flies. And because it has such an outward facing, you know, it's kind of, um, it's kind of showy in that way. It kind of is like, here's the nectar. It's a right. really great plant for, you know, for really bringing in pollinators and then they can kind of discover the rest. What about Turk's cap? Something like Turk's cap. Sure, yeah, Turk's cap is a, a phenomenal um, hummingbird and uh, butterfly plant when you think about, and, and another thing, you know, when you start to really think about how they operate, um, you know, butterflies have the really long tongue and um, they, they like to put that in there. And, you know, so a lot of the tubular plants that are really narrow are gonna be more hummingbird, more um, butterfly drawn with their narrow little beaks. And it's really sweet to actually see a hummingbird covered in pollen, their little beaks turn like a little traffic cone. And bees, an interesting fact about bees is that they don't see red. Let's talk about some asters because that's, you know, that covers like almost every flower ever. Yeah. But yeah. there's really oh, good ones that are great performers or Maximilian sunflower or fall aster. I mean, yeah. what about those guys? Well, sunflowers are great because um, you know, they're all summer long. A lot of people are concerned about what do I plant in the winter for pollinators, but right. in Austin, you know, summer is rough and things are not as, uh, you know, in color as they may be elsewhere. And so it really is important to have a lot in, in the summer. And so sunflowers are really great for that. Um, long bloomers and then Fall asters are really great because as seasons start to change, all of the spring and summers are kind of going away, fading, and fall fall aster comes at kind of a perfect time and is a is a really important staple during that time. I know that the shrubby bone set is another big pollinator, one covered in butterflies that's yeah. super duper if you've got a good sunny spot. Let's talk about just some other uh, uh, plants like the vines. So what about uh, like trumper, trumpet creeper and cross vine? Yeah, so those are, again are going to be more on the tubular family. So they'll be great hummingbird and okay. um, butterfly attractors. And you can start to see when you when you look at them, you know, they're that kind of nectarine color, um, like right. orange. And but when you start to look inside of them, they have yellow guiding lines that are pointing to the nectar, um, which is a really good way of figuring out what plants have adapted to be to be you know very nectar rich. Passion flowers are great for bee is a great vine for bees. Even star jasmine is is a, you know covered in bees in the early spring. So that's a that's an important spring or you know first first of the year kind of bloomer. As are I mean trees are really important for sure. that. Too. Red buds are extremely important. You know, that's a lot of um, beekeepers that I know, that's kind of their alpha of the year. Like alpha sign is, you know, the right. red bud and then omega is like goldenrod at the end of the year. And that's kind of their okay. seasonal cue. Well, I, that's so you're talking about trees and we, you, you just mentioned um, red bud, but that's, you know, that's kind of like a little bit, it shows and then it goes as I like. Yes. To say. So there's some others that are really good, right? Like know that uh, I've seen tons of pollinators on my flame leaf sumac uh, yes. and those that starts to flower at the end of summer so that's again that's sort of a later great flower. time and my personal favorite is kidney wood I love kidney wood okay 
Yeah. yeah. They're fragrant. They're not show. They're not too show. They're, they're a little more humble, um, but they're okay. just gorgeous and multi-trunk and yeah. Okay. You can make tea out of them. And then I have to add this because originally being from Mississippi, it's my home state flower, but the magnolia, that's a powerhouse yes. too, right? Yeah, the magnolia, they say, was, rumor has it, that it was actually the first pollinator, the first flower that was created. And it was like during Jurassic Park times, you know, you think about all the ferns and all the evergreens. And then the flower, the magnolia came out and it's, you know, really, it's a substantial yes. petal <laughs> and substantial flower. And yes. it's pollinated by beetles. And it's, you know, that is like, they're heavy guys, they're going to be there to stay and that's you know it, it can really hold them um so the magnolia yeah you're you it does your home state proud ah and then i know <laughs> speaking, of, speaking of the beatles and not talking about john george <laughs> Paul Ringo, but <clears throat> I, i've noticed a lot of beetles and flowers like opuntia the prickly pear and yeah. the uh, white prickly poppy both of those mm. i've seen a lot of beetles in those flowers yeah, yeah, it is interesting how you start to kind of see a shape and a and a cut like a very similar kind of repeating, and then you see the same pollinators on each right. type. It really does make you realize like how they have you know preferentials um, to to what you know what feels the most comfortable to pollinate. Well, what about people that said, okay, well, I don't have a ton of yard. I love my edible garden. If you're an edible gardener in in Texas, you know you it's even more imperative to have pollinators because right. those squash aren't going to pollinate themselves. It's only beneficial to have pollinators, whether they be also edible or they could be, you know, completely just a, a separate little area that they, they could draw them in and then they're there and they're helping to, to pollinate. I love to not see it so black and white. Like I love to have, have your cake and eat it too. So, you know, things like that you can harvest a little bit. You don't need, you know, if you're not pulling the entire plant, but, um, and then leaving a, a little bit for, for the pollinators, like chives right. are a great option. Rosemary is really great for that. Artichoke is a really great perennial vegetable. Mm. Um, so you can just keep that growing, you know, maybe give a couple of them up for, to be, to become flowers and they're gorgeous flowers too. Right. African basil is a great, be a tractor if you kind of let one just do do the heavy lifting of, of attracting the pollinators and then you can yeah. have you can have the rest uh basil in general is great but or letting you know i hate cilantro and i grow it because i just let it go to seed because bees love it and that way you know i have no I, I don't regret it you know i'm not mad at them for that i'm like you can have it um so <laughs> yeah I know there's a lot of us out there who don't like cilantro, so that's a good tip. <laughs> that seems like a highly controversial subject here. In Texas, and I don't, you know, we're controversy free here in the Central it's, Texas. It's Carter. genetics. It's not anything. I, I'm a Texan by, you know, I grew up, I'm a Texan. So, <laughs> so um, and then I want to talk about really quick, I want to talk about some small spaces, but back up one second. Sure. We did talk about dormancy in the summer when stuff is brown and crunchy. And, you know, I always like said, we've got to get down with brown because that's important in terms of water conservation doesn't it provide nesting material and exactly. habitat for yeah these pollinators when they're not out there doing their stuff exactly it's really great for birds it's really good for nesting material and it's also you know leaving a little space in your yard no matter what season it is is really great because a lot of native bees are ground nesters and so even right. though it may feel a little like oh god there's a big barren space what you're allowing for is you know really beautiful flowers and um, a lot more color by giving some space and, and, you know, allowing the brown for, for a little bit um, and yeah, just being okay with it. But to be clear, when you're saying leaving some space, I mean, you're talking about bare soil because they, they're mm -hmm. not, we all think of bees or pollinators in the hives, but yeah. a majority of the bees that are, are natives that we don't, might not know about, they really need that bare ground to get down in there and, and yeah, make their they're, they're solitary. They're not, they're not, they don't have um, you know, hives and, and they, that's how they, that's where they sleep. So, um, leaving that or like any crevices in, um, you know, uh, trees or anything like that. If you have it, if you have a tree that's kind right. of on its, its way out. Yeah. I don't have a house yet though. I mm -hmm. maybe got an apartment or maybe I've, I'm renting a space. that has got only the teeniest tiny of yard. There's mm -hmm. just no way I could do any pollinator garden. Right. Absolutely not. If you, no matter what size you have, you can have pollinators. Yeah. I mean, even if you have an apartment, you can grow peppers on your balcony and that those are pollinators and you get to eat them. You know, thinking about 
small, the little strips in the front of your, of your house. I think the best way to maximize those is by thinking in layers. And that's the best way to think for, for pollinators too. Um, and you can really pack in a lot in moving up. So the, the lowest la layer, the ground cover, there's some really good options. Um, society garlic chives are great. If you want to kind of integrate the edible, those are all going to be pretty bee, bee heavy. Going up is like kind of the middle, like two, two foot range. And that's, you know, Salvia Greg is a really great option for that. And Russian sage is also kind of a little higher, but it's, you know, it's the closest that lavender, that kind of lavender Mediterranean look that we love. And then getting, you know, hot back, larger shrubs, Texas sage is a great, very sturdy plant, I would say. And it, it's an interesting plant because it tells you when it's about to rain. So it's, that's a kind of fun plant. fact. Yeah, it's a fun fact to tell the the visitors. And that way, you know, you can kind of have different levels. Turk's cap is a great back there if you're looking to attract um, more hummingbirds. Yeah. So I would say if you're looking for more bee, um, this is just a very general thing. If you're looking for more bee friendly, go in like the pink purple hues. If you're looking in for more hummingbird butterfly, go in like the orange, red, tubular, firecracker fern, all the trumpet creeper, cross spine, um, Turk's cap. Rachel, I know you're, you, you, we mentioned the, all the stuff that you do, but as a co-founder of Pollinate Austin, I just really quickly, you, you mentioned the history of it, but I mean, y'all's focus, it really sounds like is, you know, not, you mentioned being a bee city, but it's really stepping back and thinking about all of these all of them. that are yeah. really important for us. Yeah, we, we work with the staff who run the, um, the Monarch, the Mayor's Monarch Pledge. So it, it is, you know, that was kind of the initial but it was also because, you know, bees are kind of the most stigmatized of them all. Like pe people right. are really happy to help butterflies, but bees are actually doing a lot of the work. So it was really to kind of, that was a, that was a big goal was like de-stigmatizing. Like it's good to have, you want to attract bees and you want them in your backyard. Um, but we are doing, you know, all, all sorts of pollinator. We're working um, on a bat pilot pollinator garden. So um, cool. there's, yeah, there's, it's, it's all over if you're, you know, just really trying to promote pollinators and, and get um, people to, to kind of think, you know, when, when they are planting, let's, let's add a few, at least three pollinators. That's like the best possible way to start. Just, just three plants that are pollinators. Well, Rachel, it has been absolutely fantabulous. And yes, I just made that word up uh, <laughs> speaking with you today. We've learned a lot. I think the viewers are really going to be able to take a lot of this information and run with it. So I want to thank you and Sweet yes. Pea yes. for showing up. Bye, <laughs> 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 and Rachel. We really appreciate it. Yes, thank you.